Okay, welcome back. Here we'll take a look at some of the components and architecture of VM encryption. First thing is, remember it came out with 6.5. In 6.7, there were some new interoperability features that were added to the product. For instance, there is now support for cloning of an encrypted VM. In fact, conditionally, but you can actually change the format. You can have an encrypted VM that is decrypted as it's being cloned, or you can actually have a decrypted VM that gets encrypted while it's being cloned. You can have an encrypted VM that can resume from a suspended state. So that's good. You can suspend an encrypted VM and an encrypted VM can revert to a memory snapshot. Snapshots can also be consolidated or must be consolidated before encryption. Imagine, right? If you're going to encrypt a VM, what's going to have to happen is the virtual disk is, need to be, is needed to be actually copied into a new encrypted form. So if a VM already has snapshots, it can't actually go through the, you know, encrypting each of the different Delta files. No, what it will need to do is have all the deltas snap consolidated into a single virtual disk, and then you can take that VM and make it into an encrypted VM. Other things, encrypted VMs must be powered off during most VM encryption operations with the following exceptions. A powered on VM can be hot cloned and shallow recrypt can be performed with a powered on encrypted VM. What the heck is a shallow recrypt? Well, remember there's these two keys that are part of a VM encryption, right? There is a key that is used to encrypt the data key and then the data key is to encrypt the data, right? So a shallow rekey is basically the outer layer, the KMS generated key encrypting key. So I can give a whole new key for the VM, but it will still be the data is encrypted with a different, with the same data key that didn't change, right? There's also something called a deep rekey, which would actually do all the layers of the keys. Uh, backup solutions, not all backup solutions that use the vSphere API's data protection virtual disks are supported. So we'll talk about backups here. They also add another little twist to this. Also things that it doesn't work with, right? Certain features do not work with VM encryption, right? And again, this is not too surprising. You're really changing the content of the virtual disk in its overall readability. So no fault tolerance, uh, the dump collector. If you're gonna have the ESX server core dump, that core dump must also be encrypted. When we say the ESXi dump collector, we're basically sending core dumps over a network. That's usually when we're talking about auto deploy, right? Where the hosts are stateless. They're not booting up from a hard drive. So they have to have their, their, their core dumps sent over the network. That's not encrypted. So that's not supported with VM encryption. Now, a few of these things are vSphere six, seven issues. Like for instance, content library could not have an encrypted VM and vMotion migration of encrypted VMs to a different vCenter server instance. Also, that's a six, seven issue. Those have both been lifted. Those are new features in, in vSphere seven that now those two are supported, right? Content library for VM encryption, as well as vMotion across vCenter server instances. So interoperability, that's a six, seven thing for those two. Then let's see here, using vSphere VM encryption with other VMware products, such as workstation. Indeed, right? Uh, this is a vSphere feature. So if you're gonna encrypt a VM and now export it and then import it into workstation, workstation doesn't have a mechanism, does not have a mechanism to decrypt it. Setting up from an encrypted VM to a serial port or parallel port. Yeah, that's kind of breaking the whole point of why we like encryption, right? We're basically taking all the VM's disk IO, sending it down a channel to encrypting it. If we are also gonna redirect some data out to another port, you're basically breaking that nice secure channel that we're establishing with VM encryption. And certain types of VM decay configurations are not supported. Yeah, so just keep in mind, you need a thick disk for this to work properly. Now the architecture, you have a vCenter server, of course, you have an ESXi host, of course, they all need to be running at, v at least vSphere 6.5. The major hardware, or at least software prerequisite is you need a key management server that's registered with vCenter if you're using standard key based encryption, or if you're using a trusted key server, the key, key, the key management server would be registered with your vSphere trust authority cluster that we talked about when we talked about the trust authority stuff back in the earlier module. So you do need a key management server. It just depends on where it's registered and how we're going to establish the encryption, right? The encryption is the same. It's just that when you have the trusted key provider, well, then the encrypted VM can only run on trusted hosts. 
if you're using a standard key provider, then the VM can be encrypted and can run anywhere on any one of your ASIC servers that have access to the same vCenter system. So the key management server though is not a VMware product, right? That is a third party product. Setting up VM encryption though, well, this is actually pretty simple, right? You need the KMS and then you need to assign the policy to the virtual machine. So you need to be running vSphere 65 letter because that's when we started adding the whole, um, you know, policies for encryption is part of a storage policy based model. And there is the built in VM encryption policy that will encrypt the VMs as the IO is passing through the ISIC host, provided you have a registered key management server. When you encrypt a VM, by the way, you've got the policy now. Now we just need to assign the policy to a VM. I can either do that while I'm creating the VM, like we are here, create a VM, and then when you get to the storage section of the wizard, you select the storage policy that you would like to encrypt the VM. There's already a built-in encryption policy. It happens to be called VM encryption policy, but you could conceivably have other storage policies that I'm not sure what other encryption mechanisms you'd have because there's the built-in one, but they do offer the option here. If you would like to create your own custom encryption policy, it is technically possible, but the built-in one will make use of what VM encryption does. So you just have to assign it to the VM. And so now that you have a brand new VM who is now assigned to this encryption policy, the virtual disks that are created for this VM will be instantly encrypted with this policy. If you had an existing VM though, and you decided you wanted to make that into an encrypted VM. So you basically are assigning the encryption policy to a VM that was already present, that was already non-encrypted, either with another policy or just with the default policy. What happens in this case? Well, if the VM was already out there with one or more virtual disks, now we have to actually create another virtual disk, attach it to the VM, and then we'll have to effectively take the data out of the original virtual disk and encrypt it and write it to the new disk. And if the VM happens to have multiple virtual disks, the conversion, basically the copying from non-encrypted to encrypted will be done one disk at a time. So if your VM had three disks, we'll do the first disk, copy from the non-encrypted over to the encrypted disk, do the second disk, copy over to the encrypted disk, and then the third disk, copying to the encrypted disk. If you had three disks, like I said, it's a serial function, but you will need to make sure you have extra or extra free space in your storage because the virtual disk will need to be duplicated while it's doing this copying. Now, if you had three disks, you don't need to have all three disks copied at the exact same time. Say one disk was 50 gigabytes, the other one was 100 gigs, and your third one was 75 gigs. The only extra disk space you will need is the space for the largest disk, which is 100 gigs. As the 50 will be created, we'll copy the data over into the encrypted disk and then the original 50 gig will be removed. And then the 100 gig will have its data copied over to the 100 gig encrypted virtual disk and then the 100 gig original non-encrypted will be removed. So you only need the extra capacity of the largest of the disks to be converted. And you can only do that when the VM is powered off. New to vSphere 6.7, you also have the ability in the UI to perform what's called an unlock operation. If a VM gets locked, right? Now this usually isn't going to happen in any normal situation. How is a VM gonna get locked? Essentially what happens is the ISIC servers, they do depend on access to the key management server. They need access to the key management server to obtain the key that will be used to decrypt or encrypt the data key. The data key the hosts already have on disk. But the key encrypting key is the key that comes from the KMS, never stored anywhere in vSphere persistently. It's only in memory. So here's the scenario. Your ESX server reboots. Is that a problem? Well, if an ESX server reboots, he basically needs all the keys he got from the KMS resent to him. If the KMS server is up and running, great. It'll send the key to the host and the host will be able to encrypt and decrypt his VMs just like he was before. But what if a host reboots at the same time your KMS server was offline? Now, when that host comes back up, he's got no keys and there's no KMS to get keys. And that's a problem, right? So what will happen is the VMs become locked, which means that there's no way to gain access to the VMs until we get our keys back. Well, the good news is that once the KMS server does come back online, the keys will be sent down to the host automatically. 
and the host will automatically unlock those VMs. So normally this is not a much of an issue. You just have to wait for your KMS server to be to be back online again. However, if for some reason after the KMS is back online, also able to send the keys down, but for whatever reason, the ISIC server will not unlock the VM, you have the ability now to do that. It's in the UI. But you do need to make sure all the prerequisites, right? The KMS must be up and running. The vCenter server needs to be up and running. And access to the original key is a main requirement. But if you meet all those requirements, if a VM does become locked and has not automatically unlocked, you can force the VM to be unlocked as long as you have the keys, right? That's the important thing, right? You can't unlock a VM if you don't actually have the keys from the KMS. So we had to have recovered the KMS and be able to have access to those keys. All right, so that was the uh, architecture. Now we're gonna take a look at the key management servers and their configuration, but we'll do that after the next break. So we'll see you in a few minutes.